in webinar. Um, the focus uh, today is um, a new uh, output we're proposing to work on um, in 2021, uh, which is the Guide to Conceptual Frameworks. And um, this is really the sort of start of a process, um, which kind of mirrors what happened last year with the uh, Research Methods Handbook. So we're trying to um, sort of learn from what worked in that process and see if we can improve it a little bit too. Um, here's a brief overview of uh, the kind of stuff that um, I'm going to talk about today. Uh, I'm going to say a bit about GoGN for the benefit of um, anyone who's new uh, or is watching the recording uh, online later. Uh, then a bit about the idea behind this project, why we should uh, consider trying to produce a conceptual frameworks handbook in the first place and so on. Um, and to kickstart the process, going to have a look at a few papers uh, about conceptual frameworks and the kind of stuff that's in there, what we, want, what we might be able to um, take from it. Um, and then uh, think a bit, thinking a bit about sort of practical steps towards actually delivering something, what it's going to look like, what's going to be in there, and so on. Um, and at the end, I think there's some time if we want to just sort of discuss some of the sort of issues around this, um, around this kind of conceptual frameworks stuff and theories and so on. And we've got a bit of time at the end for that. Um, so uh, just briefly, a bit about the GoGN. Uh, GoGN is the Global OER Graduate Network. We support doctoral research in open education everywhere in the world. Um, we have three uh, main aims. One is to raise the profile of research in open, open education. Uh, another is to offer support for those conducting uh, PhD research in this area. And we also look at um, developing openness as a process of research. So um, all three of those aims are really relevant to this conceptual frameworks handbook. Um, so thinking about uh, why we might want to do this. So last year, we produced the uh, Research Methods Handbook. And um, this was very well received. I think it's fair to say it surpassed our expectations. Um, and we know that it was shared quite widely, uh, far beyond um, the GoGN network itself. Uh, and um, we also uh, won an award at the uh, Open Education Global Conference uh, for Research Excellence. So. That was all pretty good. And I think everyone thought that was quite a successful outcome for that. Um, so the original idea sort of as for the next steps is we always thought that we'd have this companion volume, which was a bit more focused on the theories that um, people doing research in open education tend to, uh, tend to use. Um, we also have an idea that um, we, we will do a future edition of the Research Myth Handbook, maybe maybe this year, maybe maybe next year, but um, we can incorporate some extra stuff, maybe commission some extra stuff, and that would be a quite, a, quite a good um, thing to do. Um, but this is really the sort of uh, less well-defined, if you like, outcome, out, output next, this companion volume. Um, and I thought it was interesting just to look at, you know, the, the idea of a conceptual framework. And at this point, you might be thinking, OK, conceptual frameworks, theories, models, this you know, is just a kind of you know, semantic difference between them. Um, some of the stuff that I've been looking at maybe challenges that idea, certainly makes it a bit more clear that there are differences between these kind of things, um, as I, I'm going to try and um, explore in a bit. But I thought it was interesting to look at the, the Google Engram for um, conceptual frameworks. Uh, which you can see here, it doesn't really kind of figure until around 1960. Um, and it's got a bit of a kind of up and down period. And then just sort of around the millennium, see this big dip around the year 2000, and then a kind of resurgence up to the present day. And it's now sort of higher than it was before. And I thought it was just kind of an interesting, um, you know, pattern. Um, and if you compare it to theory, um, you can see that, Theory, as you'd expect, is much, much more um, widely used. Um, conceptual frameworks is here at the very bottom, very blue line at the bottom. And um, 
But I thought it was interesting that if you look at where the end of the theory line is, there's sort of a little dip down. Um, and I thought those two things together were kind of interesting. I'm not trying to put too much significance on it. Um, so what I've done is sort of follow a similar process uh, that we did with the research methods handbook, which is start off doing some desk research and just try to get some idea of like the terrain, and what's out there. So I'm gonna just share some examples of um, stuff that I thought was kind of interesting or could be useful to guide us um, in terms of putting this together. Uh, so this first uh, paper is a recent paper from last year, um, PASI, and it's uh, all about um, the importance, if you like, of you know understanding the difference between theories and theoretical frameworks or conceptual frameworks and so on. Um, and they note that it's quite common for doctoral studies to involve theoretical and conceptual frameworks. But what's less common is for the full implications of which theoretical or conceptual framework you've chosen um, and how that kind of pans out across your research project and um, whether it's done, if you like, in a kind of consistent way. Obviously, a lot of the time we have to kind of bring together more than one of these frameworks. Um, and that can be a, a sort of difficult process. But even if you're working with a well-established conceptual framework, arriving at you know, the decision to use that specific one can be quite challenging. So there's, um, obviously, I'm not going to go through the, the whole contents of the paper. Um, but they make uh, this distinction uh, into four different types of, they call them underpinnings. And if you like, as you go down the table on the left-hand column, so model down to theory, the, the model is the most specific case, if you like. And the idea is almost to have um, kind of related variables. So you know, you, do, you put in more X, you get out more of Y or whatever. And you can have these very sort of law-like um, relationships. Um, the next sort of level of granularity up is this sort of conceptual framework where it might be more flexible, it might have some criteria that relate to different contexts or something like that. Then a theoretical framework will be based on the outcome of several studies and kind of an overarching more meta level um, way of underpinning what you're doing. Uh, whereas a, a theory is, if you like, the broadest, most general kind of um, idea of, of what things are like, I suppose. Um, what is the world like? What is the social world like? And, and that kind of thing. And I think there you're getting into some of the territory of sort of different research paradigms. Um, like you, if you're familiar with the research methods handbook, we explore some of those there. And you can see that in this table, um, they've quite helpfully given examples of the kind of uh, thing they mean at that level of granularity. I'm saying granularity, it's not the, an ideal way of you know, differentiating these things, but I'm not sure how else to, to do it. I think that's a kind of you know, typology that suggests itself here. Um, but I thought this kind of thing might be useful for people where you can say, look, here are some examples of what, what you'd call a model. Here are some examples of, of what you call a conceptual framework or theoretical framework. And it means it's a little bit less abstract and a little bit more uh, tangible with those examples. Um, there's some other stuff in there. I mean, it goes into quite a lot of detail. Um, and I thought some of this was quite useful in terms of encouraging people to think about what is the what work is a theory doing in your study? Is it just because you thought I need to have a theory, so I'm just going to go and you know, choose one, and then kind of you know I've ticked that box, I've done it. Um, because you can make a distinction like the one made here where it could be more like a tool, more like a principle that informs what's going on. Um, it could be that uh, your theory is kind of building on an existing theory or creating something out of other components of theories. Um, and then also thinking about how it's, uh, how, the, how the theory is actually being used um, at a research level, if you like. So um comparing things analyzing critiquing and so on um in the lower table there's um some more sort of practical stuff relating to this i think um thinking about 
these implications, you know, so if you choose to say, well, I'm using this theory as a tool, these are the implications. Is it actually helping you analyze your data? Is it informing your discussion and so on? Um, if you're applying it as a principle, is it informing a consistent ontological and epistemological approach across the study and so on? Um, so I thought this was uh, kind of useful for thinking about some of the, the, the granularity of this stuff. Um, they also provide some examples of uh, specific studies and sort of say, well, these are the un underpinning constructs for these studies. And, it, and this kind of made me think one, one thing that it could be quite interesting to do would be to um, do a kind of um, analysis of the, the constructs and the papers that they feature in. Um, I'm not saying that we, we should necessarily do that as part of this, but I think it would be kind of an interesting genealogy, if you like, to see that. Um, but you can see here that we've got different methods, um, which the kind of methods that we discuss in the other handbook, um, aligned with spe specific studies and the underpinning construct, which could be a theory or a model or um, what have you. Um, so th this paper um, concludes with some kind of practical advice for um, researchers about how to handle these kind of things. Um, so we have things like um, being explicit. I mean, I think this is especially relevant in you know the kind of open world where people share so much. Being explicit about where things have come from and how you've put them together and not seeing that as a kind of weakness, if you like, or a flaw where you've somehow got to justify you know, the things that you've cobbled together. Um, I think being critical throughout, the temptation is that you know you need a you need a framework for a particular job. You get the framework, you think, okay, I've got the job done. But actually, you need to have a critical attitude throughout the process. Um, consistency with your um, philosophical components um, and a sort of methodological consistency that aligns to that. Um, that stuff that we discussed in the other handbook too. Um, I think this this is quite an interesting one. Framing your research question in ways that allow alternative uh, factors and features relating to different models and frameworks. Um, and sort of showing, if you like, um, that you can apply alternative frameworks to the same data, or alternative frameworks to this, you know, the same question. I think that sort of shows um, a certain level of ability and expertise with these kind of things. Um, another point they make is that if you're practice oriented or policy oriented, um, the recommendations that you can make should only be, you know, they should be contextualized by the underpinning constructs. Um, and I guess that means you shouldn't try and sort of inflate. Um, so this uh, next paper that I wanted to talk about, um, Berman and Smith from 2015, seemed quite relevant, but um, at the moment, I haven't been able to actually access it. Um, it's behind a paywall. I don't seem to be able to log in with um, my ID, but I think I would like to look at this paper. So um, if anyone has access to it, I'd quite like to have a look. Um, but I'd like to factor that in. Um, another one to have a look at, um, this paper by uh, Kivunja in 2018. And this is um, a quite kind of, uh, practically oriented paper, um, I think, in terms of the guidance that it gives. So um, they present themselves as very experienced supervisor, external examiner, um, and uh, research methods sort of specialist. Um, and they explicitly say that um, many students just can't articulate these differences, similarly to the, the first paper. Um, and so they have five questions that they use to structure their approach, which you can see here. What does each of the terms mean? When and how should each be used? What purpose does the framework serve? Uh, how, do you, how do you develop a, a theoretical framework? And what does a good theoretical framework look like? Um, so they use this definition of theory, and they, they say it's, they explains it very well. Um, I think it kind of does explain it quite well, but it's not very digestible. Um, so they say that um, a theory is a set of interrelated constructs, definitions, and propositions. 
um, that presents a systematic view of phenomena by specifying relations among variables with the purpose of explaining and predicting phenomena. Um, so three things. The theory has got a set of propositions consisting of defined and interrelated constructs. The theory sets out the interrelations among a set of variables or constructs. Um, and a theory explains a phenomenon by specifying which variables relate to other variables and so on. Um, it's a bit long-winded and a bit technical, um, but it's got a nice sort of gen generality to it, I think. Um, probably have to read it a few times to really feel like you understand it, because it's just like that. Um, but uh, anyway, they also offer some more kind of um, practical, formal stuff, I suppose, about what a theory you know, should look like, what does a good theory look like, and that kind of thing. Um, and they draw on sort of various bits of literature. Um, and it's the kind of thing that you might expect. You know, it's got consistency, coherency, clear application. Um, it's got an ability to make predictions. It can explain itself, all these kind of things. And I think some of this stuff sounds super obvious, right? But when you're actually trying to do this kind of thing and be as clear as possible, um, especially if you sometimes feel like you don't necessarily fully understand the theory that you're trying to use, which is, you know, it's going to happen if, you, if you're using anything more than a handful of theories. Um, you're going to get outside your comfort zone. So I think this can be a good, maybe sort of checklist of stuff, you know, to think it, what's what's going on with this theory? Can I use it? Uh, is it going to cause me problems um, later? Um, and so there's also, um, again, some more practical tips, if you like, uh, from Kivunja, um, which I think, most doctoral students would benefit, you know, from looking at this. Probably most researchers would benefit from, you know, think thinking through these kind of things about how well aligned your frameworks are to what you're actually doing. Um, can you have you explained it properly? You know, is, is it coherent? Um, it's a high bar, right, to be completely clear and completely coherent with this stuff. So um, I don't think it's, you know. I think it's quite natural to find it challenging. But these kind of um, checklists can be kind of useful, I think. And so maybe that's the kind of thing that we need to include as well. Um, another example um, I wanted to mention. So some of the, um, some of the uh, stuff we looked at in the research methods handbook came from uh, medical sort of journals, where they've done you know, some quite good jobs of just kind of simplifying, if you like, or explaining clearly what the essence of some of these things. Um, and so this is a, a resource developed for, um, I think it's veterinary, yeah, veterinary medicine. Um, and it's kind of a booklet, and it's a bit, bit similar to the sort of latter half of the research methods handbook in the sense that um, you've got this kind of um, uh, presentation almost like a kind of encyclopedia entry. You go, hey, here's the model, here's the thing that you need to know about this. Uh, it's, it's quite brief, right? It's quite quite succinct, um, but it gives us an option for the kind of thing that we could include. So, you know, here's a conceptual framework, here's connectivism or something, um, in a kind of a way that contextualizes it specifically for open education research. Um, another thing that's in that booklet, which is kind of interesting, is um, a sort of, they call it a tip sheet. Um, I guess it's kind of like a, another checklist, um, but recommending how to just go through the process. You know, you've got start from zero. How do I develop a quick conceptual framework? Um, and so they sort of suggest this, you know, process of like, first of all, looking for existing frameworks that might be relevant. Um, doing a literature review, that kind of thing. Um, they're quite insistent that you shouldn't really be creating frameworks unless you're really confident that there's not an, a framework that already applies. And I think that's probably you know a good idea in the sense of you don't really want to reinvent the wheel. Um, I think sometimes there can be a, a, a sense um, among doctoral students that you feel a pressure to come up with something really groundbreaking and original because that's you know the origin the, the PhD or the EdD requires you to have originality as part of your um, part of your submission. 
but you don't necessarily have to reinvent this stuff. You can just use existing frameworks quite happily, I think, and, and uh, maybe maybe aiming for little tweaks rather than trying to reinvent it is a good idea. Um, but yeah, some practical stuff about when when do you bring this stuff in? Um, what's the sequencing for talking about a framework like this in the flow of the manuscript and that kind of thing? Um, so yeah, I think tips is something we could probably consider including. So anyway, there's some some sort of initial sketches for the kind of stuff we might talk about. Um, there's different ways we could go. We could talk about theories in a lot more detail. Um, I think the conceptual framework focus actually works in some ways because we don't necessarily want to just go through a load of uh, theories. It's more practical practical to talk about these frameworks and how to apply them. Um, but I think this, that still gives us room to talk about different theories and what people think and that kind of thing. Um, so in terms of the process, we're thinking something quite similar to last time. So what we would do is kick off with a webinar like this, do some sort of needs capture, get some feedback. Then we'll send out a, a brief survey to members. And um, with the data that we get back from that, we would then start to put together um, put together a manuscript and then have a sort of open editorial process. So it's the same sort of crowdsourcing idea. I don't, I'm not sure we know exactly what it's going to look like yet. Um, but we can, we've also got the benefit of having done it once and seeing what kind of things people found it easier to share. So um, I think you can expect that survey to come around quite soon. Uh, so in terms of the style, um, I guess it's, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Um, so we'll, we'll have the similar kind of art style and attempt to be accessible as we had in the research methods handbook. In places, there's a delicate balance to be struck between um, uh, conveying the right level of complexity and trying to um, make it under understandable. So that's the challenge as I see it with this kind of um, writing. But I think the art style um, helps, and you know we can we can still have some sort of very practical stuff in there. Um, and the idea with getting getting um, data from members about this is that we can talk about things that have actually been used in uh, recent doctoral level research, um, and that gives us some pretty good context. Um, and a kind of unique angle on this stuff. Um, if you're interested in the art style and how we kind of um, went through the process of trying to create visualizations and that kind of thing, then you can have a look at this um, paper in the International Journal of Management and Applied Research from last year. Um, but any input on the art style would be quite welcome. So thinking about the timeline for this, survey should be out this month. Um, and then in an ideal world, we would have had a workshop around OER 21 face-to-face. -face. Um, I think we'll probably have an online workshop, maybe a couple of hours. By then, we should have the results of the survey and you know, a, a sketch of kind of what might be you know, in, the, in the handbook. Then following a similar timeline to last year, <clears throat> so around May and June, it's the initial drafting, July for editing it, putting it together, reviewing it, and then looking at publication by August. Um, and then I guess um, in some in some form, we'll be uh, doing something at OE Global. So we'll probably present the outcome of this there. Um, also worth thinking about over the summer, uh, so last year we had our research review over the summer. Um, well worth having a look at that. There'll be a call for this year's coming out soon, so keep an eye out for it if you're interested in contributing. Um, and I guess now um, I just want to uh, open up the, the floor really and, and have um, a bit of a discussion around this stuff with everyone and just kind of any ideas around you know, things that should be in that handbook, uh, any thoughts around conceptual frameworks, any suggestions for good things to read or uh, link to, stuff like that. 
everything is very welcome. So, thank you for your attention. Should we just, uh, okay, I haven't had the chat open because um, I've had full screen on my uh, presentation. So I won't have seen anything that you've put there just, just now. Um, so any thoughts, any comments? Anyone would like to uh, me to unlock their mic? But yeah, I will share the slides. They'll be um, I'll put them on my slide share on the GoGen slide share. Oh, it's Martin Rob. Thanks for that. Um, I think that was really useful and a, a good sort of starting point. I, I guess there's a balance to be struck in that it's not just for GoGen people. It's you know like the methodology report was used much more widely. Uh, so there's a balance between helping people who are doing a PhD sort of like how how to choose a, a conceptual framework. And you know, and a good compilation of useful conceptual frameworks that are used in OER research. Um, do you think you can combine both of those elements in, into this sort of usefully? Um, I would say yes, and I would say it sort of, sort of maps on to the handbook in the you know the research methods handbook in the way that the first part is more about, about methods and a sort of discussion around how to do it and how to pick a method, whereas the second half is more here are methods that have been used. So the analogy, you know, the analogy would be well, the first part is about how to select a framework and things to consider and tips, and the second half would be here's some examples, um, as you say, of like things that people have used or you know things that you should be aware of or something like that. But yeah, um, any of, any other suggestions around the format would be welcome. It's it's all a bit embryonic at this stage, so it can you know change a lot. So there's a comment from Deb. I'm just using my privilege now, Rob. <laughs> I think it's interesting. Um, there's a kind of idealized way of doing this, isn't there? And I think um, Glenda summarized it quite neatly in the chat further up. Um, but I'm not sure that's kind of you know that your your conceptual framework informs your methodology, and it's there's sort of a, a neat flow between those. Um, but I think sometimes it can be a bit more um, murky or <laughs> practical or something. You know, people like I, I need I need a conceptual framework quick to hang. I something. need it now. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Messy, exactly. Need it yesterday. Yeah, so and so some and I, and I'm you know I think. You know, if you're advising on good PhD practice, then you shouldn't say that. But I think it's interesting to recognise the reality that sometimes that's how it works. You know that you yeah. you, sort of, you, you need to sort of shoehorn a, a conceptual framework in there somewhere, and that is that is how people work. And and often I think that feels worse when you're you're the writer, but then when you present the work, it sort of seems and you sort of present it as like. A nice, seamless, well-constructed narrative. You know, yeah, I yeah, chose yeah. Conceptual framework, yeah. and I did this. You know, rather than I was there crying and suddenly just picked one at random, and it seemed to work kind of thing. But I think it's interesting to kind of. I'm not sure we could put that in the report, but I think it's interesting that you know, when you're doing a PhD, you sort of think it's one of those things that everyone else has done it perfectly, and you're you're maybe not doing it. So perhaps sharing some of those stories might be useful. You see the sausage, but not the sausage factory. So to speak, um, but also thinking about um, sort of agile research stuff that we, you know, we explore quite a lot. Um, the idea of being agile and the idea of, you know, spending several months selecting a, a, the appropriate theoretical framework, not really on the on the same spectrum. Um, so yeah, as you say, in practice, a lot of the time it is, you know, finding something to do the job that you need it to do. Um, I suppose you'd like to think that PhD students have a bit more um, time to, you know, properly explore some of these things. But in, in practice, that's not always the case, of course. Any other comments, thoughts you want to share? Um, I suppose also there's going to be some some frameworks that are sort of more relevant to educational research and ed tech research that I suppose we want to include in our in our glossary of 
um, you know, frameworks at the, at the back or whatever. Um, so that could be a, a way of honing it down as well to focus on um, educational and ed tech kind of papers and specifically what frameworks are relevant to that rather than just open as such. And I was kind of, you know, so I've got some um, very brief, just sort of thoughts, really, discussion points. Um, and one of the things I was thinking was, is openness relevant here to these conceptual frameworks and how they get chosen? Because um, it's not it's not like with open research where you have a more tangible sort of process when you're open, um, using open resources, publishing open access, sharing your data, and so on. Um, this conceptual framework stuff um, is not so easy to make the link with openness. Um, you could say, maybe tentatively, the openness is itself a conceptual framework. Um, if it is, it's not fully articulated, uh, I would argue. But maybe that's an angle you know we could take on this as well, is to say, OK, well, what does openness do in, in the context of conceptual frameworks? Is it a conceptual framework? Um, probably some conceptual frameworks are more relevant than others um, to, uh, to that. So, yeah, I don't know if anyone's got any thoughts around those kind of things either. Like, what's the role of openness in this? OEP could be a conceptual framework. Yeah, why not? But I guess, I guess the question is, is it or not? <laughs> to put to make it more pointed, but yeah, um, but this is, you know, I suppose this is the kind of stuff we need to work out. Um, in this, uh, in this sort of collective writing process. Um, but I think, a, you know, certainly one thing I've taken sort of at a general level from just doing even this brief bit of desk research is that most people don't go into that much detail about exactly what's going on at the theoretical level. You know, they, they don't necessarily distinguish between a model and a, and a theoretical framework and a theory and that kind of thing. Um, I'm, not, I'm not trying to say that no one does it. Of course, people do. But sometimes, maybe that's partly what it's an indicator of the quality of the of the work. Maybe how how much this is worked out. Just a thought. Um, so yeah, lots of different suggestions in the chat about things that could be conceptual frameworks. Um, I have to say, if I was to look back at some of my uh, um, research that's been published and say, what what was the conceptual framework there? I'm not sure I could always tell you. <laughs> Maybe you feel the same way. Um, so, um, but I guess, you know, in some ways, there's a sort of um, similar thing we found with um, methods, where as Martin said, there's this sort of ideal standard that everyone's supposed to be working to, um, and it's it's probably re it's probably enforced more rigorously at a doctoral level than it is at postdoctoral level, in some ways, because in a way that's partly what you're being you know examined on. Um, but yeah, what about um, if, I don't know if anyone wants to share. If they found any aspects of this challenging, and it's the kind of thing that they they do feel like they would benefit from a handbook about and some guidance, is there something else that would be more useful? We can activate your mic, or you can just stick it in the chat. everybody it's glenda oh, from cape town how are you all yeah. it's quite this is a different kind of i haven't been in one of these click meetings i was quite scared to actually talk now even i'm so used to zoom um can you all hear me oh good hi martin yeah, hear you. <laughs> great okay yeah I, I i think this i i'm really enjoying this thanks so much rob the most incredible readings that you found very very, very interesting and very nice as a finished my thesis person, but also as somebody who's starting to supervise to really get into the stuff. Um, 
And it's amazing when you when you're in it how incredibly tricky it all is. And then now, if I look at my thesis, I you know, it just becomes very clear. <laughs> so I'm hoping that I can help out in some ways. Um, and you had, in one of the slides, you had kind of three levels. You had a theory and a theoretical framework and then a conceptual framework as three different kind of pieces of the puddle, the puzzle to unpack. Um, and my experience, um, I, I struggled with the theory and moved from one to the next. So. I'm, I can't give all of you candidates any hope. It's very, it's a very tough journey. It's supposed to be tough, otherwise everyone would have one. But for me, once I'd found a theory um, that I was interested in, I could then go into the literature. Um, and so at the end of my literature chapter, so that looked very neat because there was a literature chapter and then after that there was a chapter on theoretical framework. But actually I had a bit of both in my head already. Um, and so I could go into the literature and at the end of my literature chapter, I had a conceptual framework, um, which was very useful, but was clearly informed by the theory. And for me, the, the PhD bit is the theoretical framework because theorists will give you that way of explaining something, but they might not give you a framework for your work that you want to explore. And that is the PhD. It's, it's to, to develop, certainly for, for, for me and my experience and what I was required to do at my university, I had, it had to be very theoretical. The theoretical framework is what you give as the knowledge. And it's kind of a, it's a, it's a careful combination of the theory and the conceptual framework. So I don't know if that's confused everyone, but conceptual framework, end of literature review, theory, and what you come up at the in your discussion is your theoretical framework where you're going even deeper into the explanation. So I don't know if that, I don't know if that <laughs> helps anyone. Anyway, that's my contribution. No, Thanks. That's really, really helpful. Helpful. Thanks. Thank you. Really enjoying this. Great to yeah. see you guys in chat. Well, not see, but just hear, actually. But anyway. No, I think that's really, really helpful, uh, Granda. And um, I think in some ways, you know, some, you, you can you can have these kind of constructs that come out of your literature review. Sometimes they're gonna come out of your data, I suppose. And you know, you're kind of putting it together after the fact, and then you kind of, something might jump out a little bit. Um, I think uh, I think also the, the sort of, the risk of perfectionism is always there with um, PhD stuff. And um, you can, you can be a bit nomadic and go between different theories and you know because they're not quite exactly right or it's not quite how you thought this would work out and um people you know you can spend a long time um just reading different theories and trying to understand them um you know sometimes it might take months to feel like you, you just understand a theory so um so bearing that in mind you can see that there's a there's also a sort of pressure to commit to something um because it's never going to be a perfect framework and something else I think is also relevant when you're doing research sometimes you're you're testing the tools as much as you're actually using them right and if you find actually this framework doesn't really work for the thing that I'm trying to use it for that's an outcome you know that's a research outcome that's quite useful um, so so yeah I think but it, but it definitely helps to have that sort of more more reflective sort of meta level on what you're doing where you sort of consciously realize I am testing a conceptual framework as well as you know using it to collect data or whatever. Any other experiences or things you want to share? Yeah, Verena? Um, I, just, it, I think it's more of a question because as we're just saying right here, it, we're not really sure if we're right or wrong or if it went well. Um, as part of my conceptual framework, uh, what came out was the emphasis on the methodological approach that I took. When I combined my theoretical framework with my conceptual framework, it, it, I ended up, um, like what you're saying, like after completing the, da the data collection and, 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 and what Glenda was saying, after examining 
the theoretical framework, I, I expanded upon things towards the end. So uh, I ended up realizing that design-based research is was was a huge part of my conceptual framework that I didn't quite maybe emphasize at the beginning, but at the end when you're, you know, doing your final exam and writing things up, it becomes more prominent. So I don't know, while I felt almost scared that if I didn't have a conceptual framework right from the beginning, that things wouldn't work. And, and as Martin said, I must have tried a framework, any framework multiple times, and it just wasn't, just wasn't clicking. It was because I had to make those connections between the theory, the methods, and the, and the, the conceptual framework. I don't know. Does that make any sense? I like Glenda. I'm like, I don't know if that makes any sense. It was really hard. Like no one should feel it was easy. But now I have, I was thinking, are we going to include images? Because like we can include some of the examples that we used in our actual yeah. dissertation research I mean, for sure. Some people will have created yeah. frameworks as part of their doctoral study. So yeah, um, I don't see why not. I think that makes sense. Um, I think, I think also by, both uh, you and uh, Glenda have sort of described it in a similar way to the first um, paper where, okay, you've got, if you like, the theory out there somewhere, and then you've got the thing that you're actually doing, and part of your job is to make the connections between those things and, you know, kind of close the circle on it all so you actually feel like the theoretical stuff's integrated into what you're doing rather than just, I had to do a theory chapter, so I did one, you know? Um, so yeah, so I think on the visual sides, yeah, we can definitely um, we'll definitely look at uh, coming up with some interesting stuff, and um, I think we'll probably be working with Brian again to come up with some of these kind of things. So I'm I feel like that's going to be you know a good side of the the final product. Um, so any other thoughts or comments or questions at this point? Hi, Rob. Hi. Hi, everybody. Nice to see you. Um, see you. I guess this is what seeing people looks like now. Um, I, I think my sort of thinking on this and, and coming from uh, some of the folks here from a Canadian context, um, which is, um, I think, more advisor heavy uh, often than the UK context, um, being able to weaponize this document to be able to bring it back to my supervisors or whoever else and go, no, 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 seriously, I'm allowed to do this. I think is the key point for me when I think about any of the open research we've done over the years. Um, I had a, a faculty member this summer who was absolutely convinced that open education didn't exist and told me I would never get published in it because it wasn't a real thing. Um, and I think that that piece is something that you can uh, consciously build into this kind of document, that thing that gives you the that ability to go, no, really, this is a real thing. No, really, this is something I can do. No, really, this is something that's acceptable. Um, the rest of it is super valuable, too. And, and the rest of it, like I've already, all of the links you put in today are already in my Zotero, and I'm ready to cobble them together for the things I need them to do. But that's also another piece that I think consciously thinking about how this can destabilize that are the thing that Martin was talking, I hate to agree with Martin, the thing that Martin was talking about earlier about how we have this concept, what I, what I interpreted as this conception of purity around research that's applied to PhD students and nobody else, <laughs> um, where somehow, you know, you said, I look back at some of the research I've done, I'm not sure the conceptual framework was exactly, that's how everybody else does their research. And yet with PhD students, we apply some level of purity that maybe works in a biology lab but doesn't so much work in the real world when we're talking about, you know, the feelings of humans. Anyway. Thank you for that. Um, uh, I, I agree that um, having a very strong kind of, um, you, you, you sort of said, be, be able to weaponize it, but, you know, having a kind of a point, if you like, to the document and a way that, you know, you can use it to have those kind of conversations. That sounds like a good idea to me. Um, I think the challenge with that is how do we close the circle with the openness stuff very clearly with it? Because in my head, at least, that's what I haven't quite got together. 
how does openness figure in all this and how you know how are those how are these open conceptual frameworks as opposed to non-open that kind of thing that's interesting that's a conversation i had with my supervisors four days ago okay. um, what's the answer um dave what are we going to do um was the outcome of that conversation and the reason <laughs> i wrote a blog post last night which was the start of that conversation um there i'm, I'm fortunate because my supervisors are willing to engage in this conversation but it's really about allowing the community to help shape the way that this gets done so one of the suggestions was and i know that there are a variety of people who have done their phds this way i remember al kuros doing some of his phd this way um uh, and also his uh his tenure application, where you actually allow it to be out there and allow it to get um, shaped, and even so far as to have the conceptual framework shaped as part of a community discussion, as part of an engagement process. Uh, and mm -hmm. I think that that open as in pedagogy version of open is something that uh, is certainly important to the work I've always done. Uh, and something that I'm hope <laughs> it's one of those things where if I can get away with doing it in my PhD, I will but it is secondary to my desire to getting it finished. So I'm not willing to fight my supervisors to have it work that way, which is why having a document that I could point to would make that easier. Hmm. So um, so in a way, this partly the, the traditional sort of PhD setup of, you know, it's quite individualistic. Um, and that doesn't play into this kind of collective concept of research, you know, in the same way, maybe. Um, I think, yeah, I mean, that, that sounds to me like the kind of um, case study that might be interesting to include in this this kind of handbook. So, um, yeah, be interested in hearing a bit more about it. And maybe we'll have um, a section on the survey to try and capture some of this stuff, um, at least sort of initially. Um, so uh, any other comments? I'm aware that, you know, time's getting on. So I think now's the time if you have any other contributions you'd like to make. Okay, well, um, we'll keep the uh, we'll keep the chat open and everything, but I'm going to stop the recording now. Um, so, thanks very much to everyone for your attention and your contributions today. It's much appreciated. But we hope that um, we can um, once again draw on the power of the network to produce something useful for the for everyone, especially people just starting out. So. Um, yeah, thanks very much and uh, watch this space. We'll be in touch about next steps.